Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Future of Work podcast. My guest today is Nigel Travis, the executive chairman of Duncan Brands, the former CEO of Duncan Brands, and also former CEO of Papa John's Pizza. He's also the author of a brand new book called The Challenge Culture, Why the Most Successful Organizations Run on Pushback. Uh, Nigel, thank you for joining me. Uh, Jacob, uh, delighted to see you this afternoon. I think you're on the West Coast. I am, yes, and you are in Boston, I believe. Yeah, so east to west. Yes, yes, indeed. Um, well, I have so many questions for you. I had a chance to read um, an advanced review copy of your book. Uh, but before we dive into some of that, why don't we start with just some background information about you? I mean, how did you get involved with all this stuff? Uh, I read you used to be a DJ way back when, and uh, you were in HR, and then got to be the CEO. So how did, how did you go from DJ to CEO? Well, uh, yeah, it's kind of a fascinating story. And I think the first thing I'll say, and it's something I've always believed in, that you've got to enjoy life. You know, we're on Earth for a very limited time, so it's important that you put a lot of energy into it and you enjoy life as much as you can. So I've had a lot of fun. I was talking to someone earlier today, and I think there's only one organization that I, I wasn't that enthusiastic about working for when I was working uh, full time. Um, but most companies have always been a lot of fun, very interesting. I mean, you told me before we started, you love doing what you do with podcasts and yep. the future of work. And I've always felt the same. So to answer your specific questions, um, uh, I'm a great believer that you overcome barriers. And um, um, when my when I was about 15, 16, my voice didn't break properly. And, <laughs> and I had some embarrassing experiences. And, and then when it did break, uh, I wanted to use it as much as possible. And it was the time in England when we had no true commercial radio. Uh, DJs were a thing that were seen as very special. I became a disc jockey. I also became a soccer coach. Uh, and in many ways, when I look back, both experiences were very important to my development because they were both vocal. They were both about connecting with people and audiences. And being a soccer coach was important because one week people are in, one week they're out. And I've now been a soccer coach, uh, it seems an awful long time, 50 years. Wow. Um, <laughs> so, so, but that's been very instrumental. And about the same time in my mid-teens, I did a, uh, a, a test at school um, that basically said I should become a social worker. My response to that was, well, I really want to work in industry. So they said, why don't you go into industry and, and do social work there, which is called, uh, in those days, personnel work. Well, I don't think that's a good description of personnel, but... When I did my degree as a result of that, I did a business studies degree specializing in personnel management. So I got into that. HR, just to summarize, 20 years, and I've been a general manager now since 1991. Wow. At, uh, that is an interesting story indeed. And, uh, and now you have this, this brand new book uh, that you just wrote, which, um, which like I said, was, was quite an interesting book to read. Um, so what are, what are you doing now these days? What is, what is a typical day like uh, for you? Well, the first thing is there's no typical day. Um, I'm, as it says in the book, I'm also chairman of Lake Norian Football Club in East London in England, uh, which is a club we're trying to return to its former uh, heights. Um, we bought the club where it had been appallingly managed and was a great insight in in how not to manage any organization. Um, so we bought the club in June last year. Um, we're making great progress. So today, to take today, for example, I've been out visiting a, a kit supplier. I've been out visiting the Boston Red Sox. Uh, in fact, just come back from Fenway just before this, um, this uh, call. Um, and then later on today, I'm coaching. I've got two young teams I coach. My, both my young kids who are 13 and 11 play soccer. I coach both their teams. So I've got a professional team 
and two kids' teams. <laughs> um, and then I started early this morning about five o'clock working on a presentation for Duncan because I'm still involved there. Um, I'm preparing, obviously, to talk to a lot of people about the book. Um, so it's every day is varied. Uh, and one of the big changes now, I'm doing a lot of work thinking about presentations and speeches that I'm giving. Yep. And that's helping me become a lot more thoughtful about the thing that you're a specialist in, which is about organizations and leadership. And and what I'm doing now is really enjoying life, thinking about culture, thinking about the leadership of people, and at the same time, helping my soccer club get back, hopefully, to where they should be. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, uh, I, I played soccer for many years, and um, I actually had the CEO of Worldwide Technology uh, based in St. Louis. Uh, he was a guest, and he played for the United States Olympic team, I believe it was in 1984. So there have been a couple of CEOs um, that are that are big fans of, uh, of soccer. Um, before we jump into your book and talk about some of these concepts, uh, I want to ask you, do you remember your first real job? You know, real, real job. Uh, so first, do you remember what it was? And do you remember what the work environment was at the time? And how different is work today? Well, a great subject is one I'm very interested in. So, uh, I, my first real job is tough to define, but just to try and go through it, I worked for my father, which is referenced in the book. Yep. Um, and it's all about the subject of why. I also, and I think your viewers, listeners will find this interesting because it's different from the U.S., though the U.S. is changing. Uh, my first external job outside the family business was I worked in a betting shop in England uh, mm -hmm. where people came in, placed their bets, and my job was to pay out the winnings. Uh, you don't pay out any losses, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, but my first full-time job was actually as an intern for Exxon, or as it's called in the UK, SO Petroleum, where I specialized in labor relations research. That was in 1970. And, and, and work was very different. People turned up late, normally. People worked the hours of like nine to five. And when I migrated to my next job at Kraft Foods, I always remember I got in early one morning, seven o'clock, which doesn't seem early these days, but seven o'clock, and my boss said, Nigel, you got in at seven o'clock, wow, why don't you relax and go and have a late breakfast? So, so the pace of life was very different. I used to write things, give it to someone in those days called a secretary, who would type it up in triplicate. Um, triplicate? Yeah, and then if, I mean, you didn't have, I mean, I had to have a special code to get into the copying machine. <laughs> and then I always remember when I was at Kraft, one of my superiors didn't like what I'd written and tore it up. And you have no record of what you had, you had to start again. So it was very different indeed. So I've often said, and I don't know the actual answer is, but work in those days was um, really slow. I think I probably do in two days what I did in a whole year at that time. Wow. You know, I, I never yearned for the old days. I yearn for more of today. Yeah. No, makes complete sense. Um, well, it definitely sounds like work was, uh, was, was quite different. Um, so I want to jump into your, your new book here. Um, and it's interesting that you talk about pushback. And maybe the, the very first thing we can start off with is um, what is pushback and why is pushback so important? Uh, I mean, obviously, you wrote a whole book about it. So what, what is it about pushback that's so crucial for us to understand? Well, I, I, I think there's, there's a lot of people in the world who are pretty arrogant and they think they know the answer to everything. Uh, and if I take one of the worlds that I work in, which is professional 
football in England or professional soccer. Uh, many of the clubs I see have someone who's done well, bought a club, and it's his way or the highway. I think because for most of my life I've been a professional manager leader, I've learned that you get better answers by working in a productive environment with people. So the best way of getting the right solutions is to find ways where you can incorporate people's ideas and thoughts, which may well be different from your own. So I think pushback gives you the best solutions. I think it gets the best engagement because after you come up with ideas and concepts, you have to execute and to get people truly bought in is, is, is so important. Now, what I would say, I think a lot of people find this approach difficult because it's a lot easier uh, if I just said, say I was, say you were working for me, Jacob, go and do this. Yep. I mean, it doesn't mean that yes, you've sir. bought into the concept, <laughs> you're just obeying the law, uh, the order. So my approach on pushback is somewhat anti-hierarchical and, and I mentioned in the book that perhaps some of the different countries around the world may find it more difficult to apply than, say, the U.S., which is, in my view, quite an egalitarian uh, society and, and people tend to well, work well in groups. And again, going back to the changes in technology, I think that's getting better because of collaboration software. But pushback, to answer your question directly, gives you more views, uh, often different perspectives, and builds, I think, greater engagement and probably alignment in the organization. Hmm. Hmm. Makes sense. Um, now, you've been a part of many different uh, organizations, uh, great brands, Blockbuster, Papa John's, uh, Duncan. Uh, you were part of Burger King. Do you recall a distinct culture at each one of those companies um, was one very hierarchical, was one more open? Um, and also, what was the culture like at Duncan when you first got there? And did it change after your tenure as, as CEO? Like, were there, were there certain things that you had to change in the company to, to fix or improve the culture? Okay, so a um, lot of sub-questions there. Yep. Um, and, and I think one of the great things about the challenge culture is it's really about questioning. So I truly appreciate good questions uh, like that. Um, so when I think back over my career, I worked for many companies, and I'll just list a few of them because I think most of them are big names. I mentioned Esso, um, I meant, and I was very, very junior. I was like 20 when I was there. Uh, Kraft, uh, and then after that, I went to Rolls-Royce which I found incredibly stuffy and bureaucratic. That was the one company I somewhat don't look back with relish. I loved the job. I was doing shop floor labor relations, but I don't think the culture was the most conducive to, certainly for me. Uh, I worked for a company called Parker Hannifin out of Cleveland, Ohio, but oh, in the UK. Parker Hannifin, my, my wife is actually going there next week to speak with their uh, leadership team. Okay, so when I was at Parker, which was from 1982 to 85. Um, it was known as the biggest unknown company in the world. It was the Parker seal that had a problem on the space shuttle, but incorrectly used. It was a wonderful company. It truly believed in people. And then after that, I worked for 10 years at Grand Metropolitan, which took me because we own, we bought and own Burger King. Um, so I spent the latter part of the, my time at Grand Met in, in um, Burger King. And in Grand Met, I was actually involved in writing up the culture. So that's how I actually got into all this thinking mm. and writing about it. So I was the uh, head, I was the group head of management development. And we had a CEO called Alan Shepard. And this is all talked about in the book who had an approach of management. And we said, well, let's try and codify it. Let's try and capture it, put it down in writing. And there was a lot of things about communication, mm -hmm. um, about accountability. But the biggest thing was he had this approach where he wanted people to challenge each other. 
And I called it the challenge culture. So I named it the challenge culture. So I think Grand Met had a culture that was pretty strong. Burger King, when we bought it, in my view, was a fairly sloppy culture. I think we made it much more like the Grand Met culture. So what, what, what then, was sloppy about it when you, when you bought it? Um, so how, how was I, it different than Grand Met? Well, Grand Met was a pretty aggressive culture. Everyone kind of got challenged by senior management, mm -hmm. by their colleagues. And that's why I kind of looked at it and said, oh, we should call this the challenge culture. Yeah. So that there was true questioning to make the right decision. But Grand Met had a very fast pace. My observation when I went to Burger King is that Burger King didn't. Hmm. Um, we also, I think, found Burger King when we bought the company to be somewhat over bloated in terms of headcount and 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 we tackled that um, and that was a, a project i led and then moving on from there after i left burger king went to blockbuster and blockbuster was an interesting company because the culture evolved it was very entrepreneurial when i got there and i got there when uh wayne heisinger was the uh <laughs> Was, was the chairman, the CEO, the leader, a uh, great guy. And, and one thing I've never managed to a copy that he did is his memory for names and faces was staggering. Uh, and, and he had that very, he had a terrific personal touch as a result of that. We then bought in, and again, this is all in the book, um, a person from Walmart, who tried to apply the Walmart way. So you could say that was the culture. We used to have these Friday meetings that they have on Saturdays at Walmart where, you know, everyone would stand up and then suddenly he'd say, right, Nigel, what's happened last week in Europe on sales or something like that? Yep. So you were put on the spot. I'm not saying that was bad. In many ways, that made people be prepared to be, let's say, unsettled. But so we had that culture, but unfortunately, Bill didn't last very long. He lasted like 10 months. Oh, wow. And then after that, and, and this is a major part of one of the chapters in the book, John Antiarco came in. Um, Bill Fields had actually said, You will never see another day of positive video rental comps at uh, Blockbuster. When John Antiarco came in, put the team together, I became the head of international initially. We then found a way to drive pumps very strongly by focusing on rental. And you might say the lesson there is focus. Now, at Blockbuster, we went through many interesting things, uh, and I'll try and simplify it to help answer the question. We obviously had to battle technology change the whole time I was there. Yep. When I joined the company, they actually said to me in the interview, hey, Nigel, you'll need to look, get another job in five years. They told said, you that. They actually told me that. I said, so wow. tell me why. <laughs> well, you know, technology will kill us. Uh, I can't believe I they told there. you this. Yeah. I was still there 10 years later, um, and we had the biggest year of the company's history in 2004, which is the year I left. Um Unfortunately, lots of things happened after I left that weren't so good. So, so Blockbuster was fantastic. And when I look back, because of the challenges of all the technology that was at us from the direction, and we may come back to this on, in the conversation, I decided that it, it, it was great. It made me much more technologically aware. Um, for instance, I had to learn all the intricacies about video on demand to really understand it. I think it made me much more tuned into the customer and what customers wanted. Yep. Um, and and I learned a lot at Blockbuster, and I think we avoided our demise. But at the same time, we, and again, as I reference in the book, we made some pretty bad mistakes. Like we could have bought Netflix for fifty million, um, and now Netflix, I think last time I looked up was over eighty billion. So yeah. that was a pretty big mistake. Making some and we notes. belatedly got into the business of challenging Netflix. Actually, it was taking market share away about the time I left. But it was great learning. And I think one of the things when I look back, Jacob, on Blockbuster, 
you know, we made mistakes. You've got to be humble. You can't work yeah. as I have for nearly 50 years without recognizing you've screwed up a lot. <laughs> um, and, and I think in many ways, it, it, it makes you more humble. It makes you more approachable and makes you more committed than ever to believe in the challenge culture is critical because you know you haven't always been right in the past. Yeah. And then just to quickly finish up, I went to Papa John's, which obviously has been in the news fairly recently. Yes. So I, actually, before you jump to Papa John's, can I ask you some more things about Blockbuster? Yeah, please. So um, as you know, so so Blockbuster, everybody knows Blockbuster. And in a lot of books and in a lot of presentations, people always say, oh, you know, Blockbuster, they... They didn't pay attention to what was coming. They had no clue. Obviously, these people don't know what was actually going on at Blockbuster, but they say you know, the company didn't know. They got blindsided by technology. But it sounds like, at least from your perspective, that's not true because even when you started working there, they, they told you that technology is going to disrupt the company. Um, so what, I mean, was it lack of challenge culture that you think ultimately hurt Blockbuster or... I mean, what was it? Because it sounds like they were aware of technology. They knew it was going to disrupt the business. I mean, they told you about it, yet still it wasn't something that they were able to overcome. Well, it's actually even more interesting than that. Okay, so let's give you a time perspective. Um, Blockbuster, I think, was was actually founded as a software company. Um, they then developed the video rental software and... A guy called David Cook really founded Blockbuster, then Wayne Heisinger bought it. But in the early 90s, before I got there, they actually did a joint venture with Sega and IBM called New Leaf. And hmm. New Leaf was an incredible concept because what it did was in the stores, it enabled us to copy music, video, and games, video games. So you stick, say, a cartridge in this machine and it would copy it. And I joined in 94. I actually saw this. So, you know, I can attest that it worked. Uh, and then the music industry got all stressed out about it and said, oh, this is a bad thing, all this copying, and banned it. The net result of that was Napster, uh, um, uh, Napster came along. Yep caused havoc in the music industry and you could say that was the start of the downfall of the music industry because they they didn't embrace the change that blockbuster was making so that was under the leadership of wayne heisinger we then got bought by viacom viacom bought in the bill fields that i mentioned earlier which yep. took us very much back to just focusing on retail john antiarco then replaced bill fields we then focused on our rental business. And even though we saw in the back end of the 90s all the changes with the internet, if you remember, there was a lot of fizzle at the back end of the 90s, early part of 2000. We probably didn't pay enough attention to the underlying trend is that everything's going to go online. And then Netflix, again, we probably didn't challenge ourselves to answer your question strong enough that Netflix came along. We tended to see it being a bit of a regional chain around hmm. your neck of the woods, San Francisco. We also then noticed it was doing really well in Austin, which is obviously a technological hub. So we tended to dismiss it. So was it the lack of a challenge culture a little bit? But I think rental, and we just converted to DVD. I mean, sometimes... One forgets that Blockbuster went through the transition from video tapes, VHS, to DVD. So perhaps we missed the big trend. We also missed another trend. So I'm a, perhaps siding a little bit with the critics of Blockbuster. The, another trend that came along was um, vending machines. I mean, we, mm. we had vending machines going very well in the UK, Israel, and Spain. We tested it in Dallas, Texas. Didn't work out so well. And basically canned the idea. But then Redbox came along. Yeah, and they're still around Redbox. Well, yeah, 
I was just going to say that because I read an article the other day that the number of red boxes that still exist, I can't remember the number, absolutely amazed me. Yeah. So they've done a good job. So, so I think we could have been a lot more challenging on what we did ourselves. I think we got caught up a little bit in the success of DVD. And I think the lesson that comes out of that is you need to constantly challenge everything you do and, and I, I actually say in the book, I think you can do that through s- strategic processes to make sure that you are staying up to date. Yeah. I actually um, interviewed the CEO of a company called FreshBooks, and a small software company. They create a, a accounting and billing software. And uh, he told me that one of the ways that they challenge themselves, and they have around 200 people, so nowhere near the size of any of the companies you were a part of. Um, but one time, he created a secret company to compete against his company and he didn't tell people he was doing this but he created basically a new company new software that did exactly what his current company did and when this new company started getting more sales he kind of revealed what he was doing and then they brought in a lot of those new features from this new secret company into his older company Um, so he literally created a new company to compete with his existing company as a way to challenge himself and i thought that was a, um, a a great story um, no, no, no. It's, can I just go back to Blockbuster? Yes, yes, please. Uh, I left in '94. After I left, the we we built Blockbuster Online to compete with Netflix. We also recognised that we had a competitive advantage that we could use our stores as a leverage. We gave away per month, I think it was four free rentals. Mm. And what's interesting, all those free rentals when people redeemed them spent more than the average customer. So that was an interesting learning point. But anyway, it, it continued to grow very successfully after I left. Then there was a change of management and a activist investor came in and said, well, all this internet stuff is periphery. Let's focus back on the stores. They tried to merge with different companies, including Circuit City. So again, Which also disappeared. Yeah, well, they yeah, kind of disappeared fairly similar times. So the net result was they went back to retail, ignored the big trend again. But Blockbuster, I think, could have been as big or perhaps nearly as big as Netflix. The other interesting thing is another business that we did really well in was video games, if you remember. Of course, I used to work and, at Blockbuster, by the way, many years ago. Well, thank you for your service. <laughs> um, so... So video games, so I always remember, and I think this shows how companies work. We believed that the way to take our video games to the next level, and this was in about 93, was to go out and buy Electronics Boutique, which at the time was up for sale. We put a proposal together. Our controlling company was Viacom, and by the way, Viacom were always very good to me, so I'm going to sound critical, but they did some great things. Viacom came back and said, interesting proposal, but we're making so much money on our cable business, MTV, VH1, uh, etc., that to go more down the retail route of Blockbuster would be, if you like, uh, diluting our margin, so we don't want to do it. Now, if you look back, Guess who's still going strong? GameStop. Yes. Who bought Electronics Boutique. So I know the benefit of hindsight is always about the guy creating a competitor. So I think a major learning from this is the challenge culture has to be about constantly challenging what you're doing today and are you missing the big trend? Hmm. Yeah, that's a great story. Um, Well, I know we could talk all day about Blockbuster, but uh, next was Papa John's, which, as you mentioned, has been in the news quite a bit lately. Uh, So maybe you can talk about uh, your time there, the the culture, and um, if that challenge culture was present there, too. Well, yeah. I mean, firstly, John Schneider, the founder, has received a lot of uh, comment recently, let's say. Yes, even even today. uh, What happened today? I've been out all day. Uh, I think today I read today or yesterday I read uh, an article how the Papa John's 
executive team wrote like an 800 page letter or 800 word letter uh, to the CEO of Papa John's basically kind of uh, um, not saying very nice things. <laughs> about John Schneider or about the company? No, about, about John and his involvement and how they told him not to do certain things and he would do it. And um, John said that they wanted him to be executive chairman and uh, the letter said, no, they never did. And so it's, it's a lot of back and forth. He said, the company said, you know, who's right. So there's just a lot of stuff going on there. Well, certainly a lot of stuff. So, um, so the first thing I want to say is a very positive statement. Uh, the pizza category is incredibly competitive, and John built a phenomenal company. He founded it, as he describes the story himself, um, in, in uh, a small room in his father's bar. He actually, they quickly found that selling pizza was more profitable than the drink. Yep. Uh, John analyzed, because he did washing up, which pizzas were returned and which ones were not. He developed his sauce on the back of that. He developed a brilliant company. And John is one of the smartest guys I've ever come across. So that's, if you like, all the positive stuff. I was recruited in 2000 and end of 2004, 2005, because the board had decided that we needed to improve franchise relationships. Um, but I'd also heard some stories about John about how he interferes, how he has views on different things, doesn't always uh, like outsiders' involvement, if you like, a bit opposite the challenge culture. So I insisted I reported to the board, not him. So I came in, I tried to apply all the lessons I'd learned at Grand Met. I tried to put the challenge culture in place by telling people very overtly, that's the kind of culture I wanted. And... You know, I also, and this is interesting, when I went into Papa John's, I think a few people suggested I may want to change the team. I actually changed no one. Hmm. No one at all. None of my senior team. And I just inherited the same team that John had, and I, and I put those in place. The net result of all that was that we were very successful for the first two years. Uh, we actually focused very much, again, on the learning from Blockbuster, on the opportunity of digital. When I got there, I noticed we weren't spending enough money on uh, digital marketing behind um, online pizza ordering. Um, at the time, that was like 5% of our revenue. We totally focused on it. We did things like coming up with the uh, football bowl, the uh, Papa John's dot com bowl. I remember. I remember. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that reinforced how important online was. And the net result was we, were, we, had, we had a great period. Uh, like everyone, we hit the recession, struggled a bit then. But I think we built a good culture. Uh, most of the time, to be honest, I got on really well with John. Uh, but as he admitted recently, he then started to come up with different ways of looking at the business. He used to come once a year with a different budget from the one that we were proposing at board meetings. And eventually I decided it was time to move on. I got headhunted by Duncan and I went to Duncan. But great company. Very sad to see what's happened recently. Yeah. Um, a lot of people have obviously talked to me about it. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens. But I truly think Papa John's can be a successful company again. Yeah, hey, maybe they'll bring you back to be CEO. You never know. <laughs> uh, I've been asked. Franchisees have reached out. And what I'd say is I've been a CEO for 13 and a half years. Time to move on and do other things. All right. Well, we heard it here, so no more. Um, and Duncan Brands, of course, uh, I mean, such a famous brand. Coffee, donuts, um, you guys are everywhere. Um, so let, let's talk a little bit about your, your recent time at Duncan Brands. Um, and maybe you can start with, well, first, when you first got to Duncan, yeah. what was the culture like and did you change it and how? Okay, so recognize, Okay, so I'm going to make a very important point. And I think for your viewers, listeners, this is an important point. I think it's true in any job. 
And my book, by the way, is not just about CEOs. It's about people who run anything. It could You could have two employees and still apply it. Uh, and, it and it doesn't have to be a business like I've, we're applying it now at my football club. But, but one of the things that's very important is if you've been, say, a CEO twice, as I have, the second time is so much easier. Papa John's, as we've just discussed, wasn't necessarily the easiest place to be a CEO. I have to say, being CEO of Dunkin' has been an absolute pleasure. And that, I think, is because it's the second time round, so everything seems a bit slower. And also, we had a fantastic board. And I talk a lot in the book about boards. Um, I started, when I first got there, with three private equity firms, Carlisle, Bain, and T.H. Lee. And then we went public in 2011. But the key thing when I got there was we had very few statistics, very few data points. We didn't, I mean, retail, which essentially we're in, is about pace. And it's about responding to the consumer. We didn't even have daily comps. We had weekly comps. Wow. Now, I come from Blockbuster and Papa John's, where we measured everything. Well, Papa, Papa John's, we're actually measuring it by the hour when, because we wanted to see what was happening in different uh, hourly breakdowns. So I went there. It, it, it was a fairly slow culture. It was Innovation was done by a few people, not by a lot. It didn't truly embrace in a very open way because one of the things that's inherent in the challenge culture is, is, is openness and fairly free communications. Um, so I went in there, and I think one of the other lessons I would say to anyone is, if you're going to apply the challenge culture, and you don't have to call it that, by the way, I think you have to state right up front what you're going to be. And it was interesting, this morning I talked to someone who was there when I arrived. He now works at another company. And his words were to me, I remember you came in, you talked about the challenge culture, I now realize, because I've been at this other company, I won't name it, <laughs> how badly I miss it. In other words, you know, because it is open, a lot of communications, people are allowed to effectively say what they want in a civil way. That's the key thing. Yep. You know, and I talk a lot in the book about civil discourse. And he said, at this other company... This is, a, by the way, a very big company, a very well-known company. The decisions are effectively made by one person. I see, said, I see this a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. And he said, I now want to move on because I know wow. what I'm missing. Hmm. Interesting. And so when you got to Duncan, um, that challenge culture, it doesn't sound like it was there when you got there, but you had to kind of instill it inside the company, right? Yeah, I mean... It, th there is an installation process and you have to explain it. It doesn't happen overnight. And, and, and I talk in the book about the first time I had a leadership meeting. Now, my predecessor used to have leadership meetings once a month. I think the world moves too quickly now. You've got to have them more often. Uh, and I've always moved. Um, 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 sorry, someone's dialing me while I'm talking to you, so I can't see you right now. I don't know if you can see me. Um, but effectively, uh, when I got there, I said, this is the kind of culture I want. Obviously, having been a CEO before, uh, I had a true benefit of having see it, seen it work. But in the first meeting, you know, we talk about things, no one said anything. I mean, having operated at Papa John's, where we had fairly noisy management, because it means people are fully involved in discussions and questioning and supporting each other. One of the first things I always do anywhere I go is, uh, you know, I would say, okay, so Josie, you're the marketing person. Take off that hat. Think about you, yourself as a general manager. So if you want to comment on finance or R&D or operations, please do. Because it's those different perspectives that are a major part of the challenge culture. So I was highly specific about what I wanted and described it, I think, pretty clearly. Well, and then how do you create 
um, I guess, that challenge culture? Because it's one thing, like you said, to have a challenge culture, but how do you balance that between um, not just being somebody who complains or somebody that's being difficult or somebody that's just kind of trying to be a thorn in the side of the company um, versus creating that true challenge culture? Because it's a, it's a fine well, line, it seems like. It, it, it does. And I think you're asking the question from an individual. I think the leader of the department, the company, the not-for-profit, whatever it is, has to model it. And, and I continuously model it. Now, in, in Blockbuster and Papa John's, very strong franchise organizations, Papa um, Duncan today is just about 100% franchise. We've got kind of a challenge culture built in because no one is more challenging than franchisees. I mean, these are people that put, put their uh, life's money on the line. They've had to trust the brand. And I can assure you, franchisees are pretty straightforward with their opinions. Um, but I think you have to find ways where you can channel it. So we actually upped our communication with franchisees, encouraged them to take part in all kinds of discussions. And one example I talk about in the book is what I call coffee chats. Now, coffee chats are no different from something I had at Papa John called Tea Time with Nigel. Um and, and effectively, what it is, is you get a group of people together. Uh, it's not a Q&A. You get people to talk about questions, concerns, things on their mind. And you try and get as much as you can. And, and it requires very, very obvious modeling and making sure people understand what's expected. So you get people to question and answer and discuss as a group. And I always say an ideal coffee chat is when I don't actually say much. Um, mm. So that has worked very well. You get franchisees involved. I then did it with employees. I actually do it at Duncan still with employees, uh, usually below director level, a diagonal slice of functions. Ideally, there's a bit more difficult, different ages. Uh, different services is always interesting. I mean, one of the things we always say is... Um, you know, how long have you been with the company? And it's always great to get people who have only been there a few weeks and people who have been there 30 years. And, and that, so by that modeling, you get out of people who challenge being seen as complainers. Yeah. Now, it, it, uh, what I will tell you, it's a lot easier to be an autocrat. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's, it's a lot easier just to say, okay, I'm going to do it this way. I don't really care what anyone else thinks. Uh, I'm not going to take any other opinions on board and, and just follow it. That, that's the easy way. This is the hard way, but you end up with better solutions. And I stand by, I think, our record at both Papa John's, but more particularly Duncan. In the nine and a half years I was CEO, I think we did great things through an IPO, whether you measure it in terms of sales, whether you measure it in terms of reputation, or you measure it in terms of stock price. Uh, I, I think it works fantastically well for us particularly in a difficult environment like the franchise business. Hmm. Why do you think so many people are scared of pushback? Um, it seems like especially managers are not comfortable with their quote unquote subordinates challenging them. I feel like in a lot of companies, it's the way that you described where you have a friend now working at this company. One person makes the decision. They tell you what to do. And it's like, I don't want to hear your opinion or your pushback. I just want you to do it. Why do you think it's so hard for us to kind of get that pushback challenge culture going? Um, I think I think there's several reasons. I think one, a lot of people spend their whole time aspiring to get to a senior position, mm -hmm. and there's a certain mm -hmm. feeling that, hey, I'm here now. I've earned it. I'm the boss. I'm in charge. Um, as there's actually a great little one of these little sign things that people hang in their office. Uh, I'm in charge, and you'll do what I say. I mean, uh, but I think I think that's part of it. I think it's easier, as I said earlier, to just to say, okay, this is the way we're going to do it. I mean, it's interesting. As I said earlier, I coach um, kids' soccer teams, and I've got, in fact, two practices later on this afternoon. Um, and I've always given the kids the opportunity to say what they think. Because what that does, it helps them think about the game and it helps them integrate the learnings far better. 
If I just tell people, okay, you kick the ball like this and this is all you do, you need to tell them why you're doing it. So I, I will ask them, why do you think we're doing it this way? So so I apply it there. But I, to get back to your question, I think it's, it, it's rising through the ranks. A certain status goes with it. I, and I think the most, biggest reason is people are too lazy. Mm. Uh, it's a lot easier just to get on with it than set up all the sessions of trying to challenge the work. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I definitely agree. You actually had a really good story in your book, um, and I'll, I'll let you tell it. it. It was about Paul, and it was during a meeting, and you guys were talking about hiring costs. Do you remember that story yeah, from the yeah, book? Yeah, 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 Paul. Well, Paul's a great guy. Um, he's a good friend, done terrific things in a certain number of companies. He's currently at Mod Pizza, which is, oh, is, I know you Mod know, Pizza. Other, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he, he went there. I'm actually pretty significant investor there i love it i think it's going to do really well uh, and they have a great people culture if you study that company so paul was around the company i was looking at our cost at duncan uh, i basically said i thought we could take a certain number out i can't remember what number was uh, and paul basically this was in the days when the challenge culture was still getting established said nigel i think that is ridiculous there's no way you're going to do that. So he pushed back. There was some surprise in the room because the others didn't see pushed back being allowed because that wasn't previous behavior. So we then had a big dialogue about it. I think we ended up where I came off my number. Uh, we modified it. We thought about what was practical. But you do need some people to model the behavior to make it truly helpful. And I think if I was giving one piece of advice to people who are moving uh, organizations, if you've got someone who's been, who's been through the challenge approach before, if you can take them with you, it truly does give you some shortcuts to creating the true challenge culture and setting it up in a new organization. Hmm. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, well, I, I guess... It's, it makes sense that the manager and the leader needs to be the one that comes out there and says, okay, this is the culture that I want. It's okay for you to question me, to ask yep. you know, why we're doing certain things. But let's say, for example, you work in an environment where the manager doesn't come forward to say that and you work for that kind of a manager. Is there anything that you as an employee can do to try to create that challenge culture? Like, Can you speak up to your manager and say, Hey, you know, I know that you made this decision. I don't exactly agree. Here's some like, how do you bring that up as an employee without uh, without getting fired? I mean, if you well, can. Okay, so so this didn't actually go in the book, but we talked about putting it in the book, um, and 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 I think a little bit goes back to how things are set up differently in Europe from America. Mm -hmm. One thing I've always struggled with in America is employment at will. Yes. I think the concept that someone, and let's, let's, let's take a relatively low level job. You can imagine whatever job it is. And you know, I'm not going to pick a job because someone will write to your program and saying he's got a down on that this. Nigel. He insulted. Yeah. Him. Yeah. That's happened to me. <laughs> so <laughs> let's imagine a job and let. Let all your listeners imagine whatever job it is. But it's a fairly menial, repetitive job, let's say. And they've worked loyally for, the, loyally for the company for, say, 14 years. They can get fired next week with, without any true compensation. Yep. Um, now, I personally don't believe that's right. Now, in Europe, under European law, that 14-year year person will get, like, 14. I, I think it's, it depends on country, but let's say... 14 months pay, right? Mm -hmm. Gives them, if you like, some security. And as a result of that security, I think it's easier to challenge in Europe than perhaps it is in this country. So that's, that's what didn't go in the book. So to answer your question, I, I think some of the tactics you have to apply are, you know, can I sit down and just talk about a few things? And I think you have to be so, you have to be firstly civil. I want to underline this word. This word is really important. You know, it, it is no point attacking people aggressively. You need to be civil 
if you're to really influence them. Secondly, I would use some open questions to my boss, you know, such as um, this project we implemented, do you think we could do it better? Would you be interested in hearing how I think we could do it better? So I think you need to get them tuned in to thinking there may be some other solutions, but to just go in and say, this is crap or something, is not helpful. <laughs> not going not to get you very far. <laughs> no, no. And, you know, going back years, it's, it's not the way to win friends and influence people. So the civil, the civil positive approach, but use of questions. There's a chapter, and you've read it in the book about questioning. And, and when I was researching the book, I actually looked up how many books there are on questioning. Very few. Yeah. I think and, you, and, you called the, in the book, you called, um, um, what was it called? You wrote about the Johari window. Is that what it was? Yeah, J- Johari window. The Johari window, which, by the way, I'm not an expert on. It's just one of the psychological tools that I've used through my career. Basically, it talks about how people operate in arenas. And it's about how much, how receptive you are to hearing comments about yourself or your style from your subordinates, from your colleagues, or even from your boss, and also how you're willing to give feedback to others. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think two people, too many people think of themselves first. uh, And I also talk in the book about uh, how I think there's, there's a book called Give and Take. I've yep. I, I referenced that. And I've always tried to model, probably means I haven't succeeded, on giving more than taking. And, and for example, I'll give you an example of where I'm trying to give. Um, a guy phoned me up the other week. He's a professional soccer player in England towards the end of his career. And he said, Nigel, I heard about you. I know you've got a book coming out. Uh, but one of your players told me you're a really nice guy. So, 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 thank you very much, you know. So he said, I'm going to ask you a big favor. Will you become my coach? Uh, <laughs> and, and I want to learn more about the commercial world. Uh, you know, my career is coming to an end. I've loved playing professional football. I want to become, you know, move on the commercial side. I've done this study, that study. I've been on this course, all that kind of stuff. So... He and I have now started this relationship. That's what I call giving. And, yeah. and you know, despite the fact it doesn't seem as though I'm not, I'm not going to get anything out of it, I think I will because I'll learn a lot more about football from talking to him because he's been in the business a long time. But I think people should think more and more, more, and more about giving rather than just taking. Hmm. I love that you actually mentioned a difference between the United States and Europe as well. Um, Because it sounds like it's easier to have a challenge culture in Europe, whereas in the United States, maybe people are more scared because they don't want to speak up for fear of just kind of being fired on the spot. (laughs) Exactly. And and that's the whole point about employment at will. Uh, Now, I'm not saying I'm ever going to change it. I mean, I'm, I'm, I've got, Two nationalities, American, which I'm very proud of being American and, and, and British or European, I'd love to say, because I truly believe in the European uh, approach. But I, I think there is something in what you say, that there is this fear that if you speak up, it's not done. Um, and, and I understand why people are scared, because everyone has to pay the bills somehow. Yeah. But, but I think there have to be routines and ways to try and challenge back. And I think the things I laid out a minute or so ago is the way to do it. You've got to start positively and use questions to get there. Well, I know we only have a couple of minutes left. Um, so why don't we jump into, um, well, I, I guess two, two questions, then I have some just some fun questions about you. What happens or does a challenge culture ever go wrong? Have you ever been in a situation where it doesn't go according to plan, where it leads to an argument, where something bad happens? Um, and, and what happened? How do, you, how do you deal with that? Well, okay, so I'm not saying it hasn't ever gone bad where people may get over-aggressive over the, or even over-enthusiastic about a different set of ideas. Yeah. 
I think one of the philosophies I've always had in life is that you have to try and debate things out. Yeah. Sometimes that takes a bit of extra effort. Uh, I can't think of an example where it's gone really bad, where someone's just like quit, quit on me because they didn't get their way. Um, I, I think what I would say is where things are, let's say uneven in the relationship, it's important to work it out. I mean, if I have a difference with my wife, I try and work it out. If I have a difference in the organization, I try and work it out. Yeah. At the football club right now, we've got a little bit of a personnel issue between some different groups. We're working it out. Yep. I mean, you know, challenge culture is not a panacea. It is, I mean, you know, all the normal things apply. You have to be disciplined. You have to be organized. You have to be, you have to plan. I mean, as I've, used to say on training courses years ago uh, to fail to plan is to plan to fail yeah i heard um, that quote yeah that's a great quote yeah i mean uh you and another thing i say in the book so i'm throwing a few things out you have to keep anticipating the future but i think what people don't do they give up and just say oh well we've fallen out and that's it that is not the way forward the yeah. way forward is to try and work it out because sometimes that person who's been negative because they've seen things differently, they could really help you come to better solutions down the road. Yep. Hmm. Makes sense. Um, all right. And last question to wrap up before we jump into some fun questions is, where do you start? So people listening to, the, to this, um, I'm sure there are some managers listening that are saying, you know what? I want to create this challenge culture. I want to encourage people to question me. But for some reason, they're not doing it. For some reason, even though I tell them it's okay, they're still not willing to speak up. Uh, and you probably have other managers who are thinking, oh man, this Nigel guy is crazy. I don't want that in there, but you know, maybe there's something to it. I want to try it out. So how can you start to test the waters and start to bring in this challenge culture in there um, into your organization? Where Let's say you got brought into a very conservative company. Um, there was no such thing as challenge culture. How would you begin to introduce it? Okay, so great question. And, and, you know, I'd reference anyone who is kind enough to read the book to look at the last section, which is called the challenge culture checklist that I've got in front of me here. Um, and, and I think this is helpful in answering that question. But what I would say is the key thing is to start modeling it as much as you can yourself. The second thing I would say is it is not one of these things you pull off the shelf and stick it in like a, one of the old Blockbuster video cassette tapes. <laughs> it's not that it easy. It huh? just, just doesn't go in and start working. It takes time. You need to be a little bit patient. So I would go in, start asking some questions in an incredibly positive way. Uh, and then perhaps just drop in. I read this thing about a thing called the challenge culture. Perhaps we could discuss it. <coughs> perhaps get a colleague or two. Maybe you get a copy of the could. book. Well, yeah, I, I wasn't going to be that blatant, but thank you. <laughs> um, I w and, and I think perhaps talk about it to someone who's friendly and say, hey, I think we'd be better off if we approach things this way. And, and there's not one way of doing the challenge culture. It's Challenge culture could be described, as you said, right in the first question, but on pushback. But it's positive pushback in a civil manner. So I think getting a friend or a colleague working on it, and then I think gradually you can bring more people into your circle. So don't go too fast. Don't be too overt about it, unless you're perhaps the leader. If you're the leader like the CEO, it's easier. If you're, uh, you know, I've got a fr friend of mine, uh, who actually commented about the book, gave a recommendation about the book, uh, who runs a major uh, not-for-profit organization. Well, I think she naturally manages like this anyway. But people uh, have got this problem are in the middle of some organization. So I think you try and keep it small and you then try and get bigger as you have success with trying the questioning and pushback techniques. Perfect. I think that's a great way to um, end that section. Uh, okay, now just a couple of fun questions about you before we wrap up, just so people can get to know you a little bit better. Um, what do you consider your greatest business failure? Okay. Um, 
Right, so interesting story. I think my biggest business failure was when I went to Blockbuster, I inherited a plan to go into Germany. Uh, I picked up the plan, probably didn't challenge the plan enough. We forgot either me, people before, or all of us, but I'll take accountability, failed to take into account that in Germany at the time, video stores weren't allowed to open on Sundays. Well, that's a pretty important day if you're relaxing. Weren't allowed, really? No. They, and one of the reasons was that most of the other um, video stores in Germany um, had pornography, so that was one of the aspects but the main reason is germany has pretty strict trading rules on on stores you could also not open on public holidays so if you think about it you lose every sunday that's 50 odd days a year plus let's say 14 public holidays you're losing 60 days a year of revenue so mm -hmm. that was missed and, and i think also germany i mean the attitude towards movies in Europe is different from the US. Um, if you take a, I mean, if you take the, the, the show Showgirls, which was, I think, NC-17 in the end here in the US. Yep. In Scandinavia, I think it was rated 30. Wow. <laughs> so big difference in sex and violence. And it goes the other way. So... I don't think we were culturally attuned enough to that. Hmm. But the bottom line, tying it back into everything we've talked about in the book, is we didn't challenge ourselves well enough as to whether Germany was the right market to go in. And, and I always remember a boss of mine said at the same time, I was agonizing after two years, Germany was going nowhere, we tried everything. And he said, and it sounds a dreadful phrase, but think about it because it's, it's probably uh, more positive than it sounds he said nigel sometimes you have to kill your own babies oh yeah I, my wife tells me that all the time uh, uh she says sometimes you have to kill your darlings yeah so okay so um so so i think that's the biggest failure uh what are you most proud of um or what is your greatest accomplishment i think my biggest accomplishment is all the work we've done here at duncan i mean this is a great company Two great brands, Baskin Robbins and Dunkin' Donuts. Uh, I think we've really got our franchises behind everything we've done. That was very, very much driven by the kind of work that we've just talked about. So I think the work at Dunkin' has been uh, my biggest accomplishment. And I think you see it in all the different results that we touched on earlier. What was the hardest business decision you ever had to make? Um, well, okay, so at different times you have to shut down units, stop businesses, but the hardest thing if you care about people is letting a lot of people go, and I've had to do that as all general managers do in reorganizations, and we had to do a lot when I was at Burger King. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. People always say that uh, they hear about these stories and they say, oh, you know, the company doesn't care. They're laying off thousands of people. Even I've said that before. Um, but that's not entirely true, is it? It's not because you don't care about people and you're just letting them go. It's, I guess you're focusing on the business and what you can do to keep that growing. Well, sometimes, you know, you need to reinvest resources from one sector to grow the business to make the business successful in the end. And, you know, I, I had another boss say to me once, you always got to think about the gas and brake pedal. You know, it's mm -hmm. fine going for revenue, but the brake is there to try and reduce costs. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, what's your favorite business or non-business book, not including yours? Uh... A great book to read, and I think I hopefully I got the title right. It's mentioned is when I first became CEO, I read a book by Jim Citron called uh, "I'm in Charge Now What." Hmm. I'm going to check that one out. I haven't heard of that one. Yeah, it's good. It's it, it, it's excellent. Uh, who is the best mentor or coach you've ever had during the course of your career? Um. Hmm. That's a tough question. Um. 
I think I had a great guy in, early in my career when I was at Massey Ferguson. He was also at Rolls Royce. In fact, he took me from one company to another called David Henline. I think he really made me think about, he made me translate from being a young student who's working into a young executive. And I think hmm. he, he was very helpful. But I've always been fortunate. had a lot of good people who put me on the uh, right direction. And Barry Gibbons, who was the CEO at Burger King, really helped me a lot by moving me from human resources, which I was very focused on staying into, into general management. Uh, so I, I owe him a lot as well. Very cool. And the last question for you is, if you would have ended up doing a different career, what do you think you would have ended up doing? Well, I can answer that very clearly because about the age of 10, I wrote a, a story about soccer or golf and I sent it to a newspaper and I had for several years a relationship with the editor at that newspaper uh, and I, I would have been a journalist. Oh, very nice. And uh, who, outside of the soccer team, the, the, the one that you uh, manage and help lead, uh, who's the, the, the soccer team that you're always rooting for in like the Champions League or the UEFA League? Well, uh, I probably gave you a clue earlier on because I was at Fenway Park and it's uh, Liverpool. Ah, yes. I'm sure there are lots of Liverpool fans. Uh, well, Nigel, you've been very gracious with your time. We went a couple minutes over. Uh, why don't you let people know where they can get your book? Uh, is, I don't. Is it officially out? I think it's. It, it came out in August, right? So it's now. No, out. no, it comes out September the eighteenth. Oh, September eighteenth. Uh, so, so in a couple of weeks. You can pre-order it at uh, obviously any of your favorite retailers. Yes. Like Barnes and Noble. Uh, we've got the official launch at Wellesley Books here in Wellesley, Massachusetts, on the seventeenth. Um, but you can also go onto Amazon. And they've got audio editions, hardback editions, uh, paperback editions. And in the UK, you've got Amazon.co.uk. And and people like Smith and Waterstones have already got it up on their website. And, and you know, the UK edition is very marginally different. Mostly the spelling, I think. Yeah. Uh, from, <laughs> from the US. Um, but we see this as a book transcending different cultures and different countries. So you can buy it in a lot of places. And where can people go to learn more about you? Uh, I believe you're on LinkedIn, <laughs> a, a website, anything else that you want to mention for people to connect with, please go for it. Yeah, I'm on LinkedIn, but I'm also very visible on the Late Orient Football Club website in England. That's L-E-Y-T-O-N. Some people get it wrong. So Late Orient, lateinorient.com. Um, and uh, so... You know, that's that's probably the best place. And uh, I'm not a big, so far, I haven't got into writing things on all kinds of sites and blogs or doing the kind of professional stuff that you do, Jacob. So uh, that may come down the road, but uh, the book was a big project. I've enjoyed it, learned a lot, and uh, hopefully people will benefit from reading it. Oh, I'm sure. And uh, perhaps people will see you at one of your upcoming speaking engagements uh, well, Nigel, thank you for taking time out of your day to speak with me. I really appreciate it. Well, Jacob, thank you for your interest, and thank you to all your listeners. And uh, thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, I'm also doing a video here, so those of you listening, you can't see the video, but I'm holding up the book. And uh, my guest today, again, has been Nigel Travis, executive chairman at Dunkin' Brands, also the former CEO of Dunkin' Brands, former CEO of Papa John's Pizza. And the new book is called The Challenge Culture, why the most successful organizations run on pushback. And I will see all of you guys and girls and gals next week.